Rabbi tonight, we are holding tonight, uh, today, today was Yubei's Tamils, tonight is Yud Gimel Tamils. These were days when the, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, he uh, was put into jail and he was released these days. The story of Ikitzer was that he, when, when the communists came in, slowly they started to uproot all of Yiddishkeit. None of that had, unfortunately, Jewish people that joined the Communist Party that were called the Yivsexia. Yivsexia means in Russian Jewish section. And they helped out the communists to uproot all of Yiddishkeit. So they would, they knew everything was going on, where the shuls are, where the mikvahs were. And there was suddenly, there was overnight, there was a closing down of Yiddishkeit and Russia and of yeshivas and everything. So a lot of Yidin were afraid, and uh, understandably so. Our defeated Rebbe stood up and said that he's he's continuing, and he also demanded his Chassidim to continue. He made a pact with his Chassidim that they should go until the end, and he would send his shluchim around to different cities to be malamdim, and they would have to hide and. And sometimes the Lam would get caught and put to jail, and sometimes the Chmanot Slan they were killed. We have Rabbi Yechon and of the rabbi here, his Zayda was shot. His Zayda was shot by the communists at a time in 1938, 36. That, those years are very tough years for the Chassidim, 36, 37, 38, when they. The year Tafre Sadeches was called by Chassidim Tirzach, the year where a lot of them were shot. They didn't know where he was buried till recently. They found out the KGB, the police gave very good archives of every all their atrocities. They know exactly what night, what day he was killed, and they know the yard site. They never knew all the years. Now they figured out the yard site. This is the rabbi's great His Zayda. His elder Zayda. His great grandfather. Yeah. His Zayda is is all saying his is a hundred years old. His Zayda's father, yeah. He was a... Uh, so Lameisa, yeah. Lameisa was the Fidik Rebbe got word. They were very upset with the Fidik Rebbe's position, obviously, that he was continuing. And they were watching him, and they were looking for every way that they, what they can do. Kainta's story was the sexy he tried to make in 1927, tried to arrange a, a meeting of Rabbanim. And they, behind the scenes, they w- made a meeting, wanted to arrange a meeting of all the Rabbanim. And it was going to be in Leningrad. Leningrad, which is called Petterburg or Leningrad, where the Fidikeva was. And they, this meeting basically was, if Sexy was behind it, but on the open, people didn't know who was behind the meeting. And they went around to try to get the Rabbanim to come. And then the Rabbanim themselves at the meeting, because they're all scared and they're under threat, will say that it's okay not to keep Yiddishkeit, if they don't have to do this, you don't have to do that. They wanted the Rabbanim themselves to do it because it would make them a lot easier for them if the Rabbanim themselves would say something. They did the same thing with Lahadu with the Galochim. They managed to get the Galochim together, the priests and the priests. Why did they want the Rabbanim to say? Well, they, they, they were having a difficult, they wanted to make themselves an easier time to get rid of Yiddishkeit. Keeping yeah, Yiddishkeit. Yeah, yeah. So they wanted that the Rabbanim themselves should get together yeah. and they themselves should, at the meeting, under under pressure and fear, that the Rabbanim themselves will make different statements there, how it's okay, we have to listen to the communists, different oh, things, wow. and this way it would be easier for them because it would look like they didn't say it, the Rabbanim themselves right, are saying so it, so, so okay, the Rabbanim wow. are saying it. They did wow. the same thing with the priests and they were matzliach with it. Wow. They got them to they also had issue with the religious, uh, other religious groups. Well, Maisa was, the Friedrich Rebbe got wind of it, and he realized it was coming from the Sexia. So he sent out a letter, letting all the Rabbanim know that it's the hand of the Sexia behind it, and no one should go. And now the Sexia was really mad. The Sexia came, and that's when they came to arrest him on Tess Bav Sivan, the 15th of Sivan. They arrested him. He was in prison for two and a half weeks till Gimel Tammuz. Originally, he was sentenced to the opposite of uh, Chaim. He was sentenced to, just like his Elta Zayda was. 
Bar, they, they, they crossed that out and they wrote that he should go for 10 years to Siberia. And then they crossed that out and they eventually, there was an immense pressure, also from the American government, a lot of pressure to free the Fidik Rebbe. So they were working very, very hard to get him out. There was also a famous uh, non-Jewish a lady who fought for humanitarian rights that worked very hard. I forgot her name. She worked very hard to uh, release the Fidik Rebbe. And uh, Gimel Tamils, they actually told him he's 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 a he's allowed to go. He's going to go free from jail. They're going to send him to a city of Kastroma. He's going to be in exile in the city. The city is a small city. He'll be far away from being able to make any trouble. But send him there for three years, and that should be his lesson. Well, my, he went there. He went to Kastroma. He gave a very famous speech from the train station. All the uh, people came to wish him goodbye. The, the Jewish people, and he gave a famous speech that our only our gufim can be put into Gullus, but not on the Shama, and everyone should stand strong and keep Yiddishkeit. And he went to Kashtama. When he was in Kashtama, he stayed there for only nine days. On the 12th of Tammuz, he was notified he's going to be released from prison to go back home. But that day was an illegal holiday in Russia, so they couldn't give him the forms. So he had to stay in jail till the 13th of Tammuz. The 13th of the time was he, got, he was officially released. And then he went out and went back home. So it was a very big simcha for, not only for the Hasidim, but for all the Russian Jews who were under a big threat then, that they're, they're taking a leader, a, a, the greatest Jewish leaders in Russia at that time, putting him away like that. It was a very, very big simcha. And also, you know, Yubay's Tamils is actually the Yom Haledis of the Fidik himself. It was personally Yom Haledis. So the Geula came was only a Maledis. You know, Yutas Kisle, when the Alter Rebbe was released, was when the, on the day of his Rebbe in the Zichamagid's yard site. The Fidik Rebbe was only a Maledis, he was on your base Tamils, and he became So therefore, Chassidim always celebrated. The Fidik Rebbe wrote a very famous letter afterwards saying how it wasn't only he who was freed, it was anyone, anyone Jewish, and anyone who calls himself Jewish, even if he's not religious. But if he calls himself from a shame, Yisrael Yichuna, he's called a Yid. Even for him, this day is a gula for him, a certain sense of a victory over the, the the government. A few, a few months later, the Fidik Kebab eventually left Russia totally. This was a catalyst for him, for letting them letting him go, and he went out of Russia on Isru Chag of that following year, 1927. The summer 1927, he was in prison, the beginning of the summer. And Isru Chag of Simchas Torah, he was, he was left Russia totally, never went back. He went to Riga, to Riga, Lat, Riga Latvia. And he was, that Simchas Torah was a very emotional Simchas Torah, where the Friedrich ever said goodbye to all his Hasidim, who were left in a very wow. extremely tough situation, a very, very emotional Tabrengen. Uh, the Fidik Rebbe gave him chizuk for all the years to come and he told them that even though we're going to be far away in distance but uh, it will not uh, separate us we'll continue to keep a kesher and when he was in the train station on Yisru Chag he wrote a famous letter in the train as he was ra- dip- waiting to depart he wrote a famous letter in the train to all the, to the Hasidim and for many years the Hasidim when they were stuck in Russia they would feel down, they would get up by Favrengen and read this last letter that their Rebbe gave them and that would give them the chayis to uh, continue. There was recently an interesting book that came out where someone described the life in Russia, the way it continued. Most of the Hasidim managed to leave Russia. Russia didn't let you leave, so it was not Pshach Hasidim could leave and keep Yiddishkeit somewhere else. It was very difficult to leave. Some people managed to leave at certain times. Rabbanim a lot of Rabbanim managed to leave. Ramesha Feinstein was a Rav in Russia. There were many other Rabbanim in Russia that didn't manage to get Rabbi Zevin, Allah Shalom. They managed to leave Russia at different earlier times and they got special permits from the chief rabbinate in Eretz Yisrael. Different special, but most people weren't able to leave. Everyone was stuck. Until after World War II, it became an amazing opportunity where there, a pact became made, was made between Russia and Poland. Poland, during the war, uh, you know, we, we know a little history, we don't have anyone here who can remember, but uh, 
Poland, they made they divided Poland, and eventually German Germany conquered Poland, and a lot of people, Polish citizens ran into Russia, fled. Those were able to flee, fled into Russia, and they fled deep into the Russia as the Germans were coming in to Russia. They, the refugees flew and went to Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan was very far away from the war front. It was a, a Muslim uh, country. And uh, there in the two cities, Samarkand and Tashkent, were a lot of Polish refugees and also Russian. Russian Gidim that also went there. And, and all the Chabad Hasidim, most of them went there. Those that understood the threat of the war and the threat of the Germans took leave. Someone never killed in where they were in their towns, but those that knew went all the way to Uzbekistan, far away, and that's where they lived. Amongst there were Sephardim who lived there, Sephardim Shakihilis, the Bukhari and Yidin, and uh, they stayed there till the till the war end, ended. During the war time, the KGB was very busy with the war, so there was a lighter time for people were able to be much more open about the Yiddish guide. After the war ended, they got back to the work and they clamped down again. In 1947, Poland and Russia signed a deal that they're able to, all their citizens should be able to leave Russia. Now Russia didn't understand why anyone wants to leave because it's unbelievable. It's uh, <laughs> the Shiach times over there. It's uh, Ghanedin in Russia and it's unbelievable communist idealism. So they didn't want to let anyone go. So before any Polish citizen had to leave, they had to go through an interview with the, the, the Russian authorities to ask them, why would you want to leave Mother Russia? It's such a beautiful place. And of course, you have to say how you really love Russia. It's so unbelievable. You know, this is a Polish person himself told me this story, a Polish Yid. He told me this story. He said, you know, when my father was in the interview. My father said, uh, we really love Russia and everything, but at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're Polish. We're, we feel like we want to go back, you know? Well, Maisa was that Hasidim took this opportunity. This is the only way that they can escape from Russia. And when they were in Mamash and Sakon over there, was they figured out ways how to get um, forged Polish passports. And this way they can go on these trains. Poland sent trains. Poland, Poland remember, was a satellite country of the Soviet Union. It was part of, but it was still an independent country to some extent. So they sent trains that were called es echelons, echelonim. These trains were sent in to take back all the refugees. There were trains going on for a few months then. Hasidim got together and they, they had a whole factory of getting passports and different things. And they didn't speak a word of Polish. And they had to get the whole family aboard. It was a very big sakona. And they, they didn't want to be questioned by any Russian authorities because they wouldn't see, they couldn't speak Polish. And they had no idea where they, what they're doing, where they're going. And they had a kid, the children couldn't speak together. If the children would start chatting in Russian, they would figure out who they were. They used to come to the train station to a minute before the train left, was supposed to leave, come right away on, so no one would, they wouldn't be sitting around. They go on the train, and then when they were on the train, they were asked to show the papers, and it was a, it was a very, very successful operation. 300 families left Russia that way in 1947. The bulk of, of, of the Russian Hasidim that were there left. There were some who either didn't have the money, it costed a lot of money to do all this. People want people, there were certain people that tried to try to benefit from this, you know, charge money for this. There was issues. And they took them, those certain people couldn't afford it, certain people couldn't uh, didn't make it, they missed the train, or or some people were had older family members, they didn't want to leave them behind, or they were scared to do it, whatever reason it was, there were many who remained. But the bulk left at that time in 1947. It was a famous train. One of the biggest Hasidim was her name was Remendel Futafas, was very famous. Remendel Futafas originally was planning and going on a little bit of an earlier train. He was one of the heads, the leaders of these groups that were leaving, ar arranging these arrangements. They were all done in secret. But he at one point he was planning and going, but one of the Hasidim told him, the big Hasidim fabrained with him, and he said what you're basically saying is, if you're going to leave and there's still Yidin left behind that didn't yet go on the trains, you didn't make sure everyone left, that you're saying, Mesidus Nefesh Mesidus Nefesh also has a limit. So you can't go. So he took the, his word for that. He sent his family, but he stayed. And he waited till the very last train that the Polish government sent. 
And he went on that train, and the KGB hopped him, and he was sent to eight years in Siberia. And he, he because of this whole, this whole thing, the, the Russians figured out how they got out and all this stuff. For eight years he sat there. Even after eight years, when he was released, he was not allowed to leave for another eight, nine years because they didn't let him leave Russia. So his family was stuck. For many, many years they lived in England without him. And he was sitting in Siberia, and then he left. And finally he managed, in, in the 60s, later on he managed to get out. It's a very heroic story, uh, these stories. A few years ago, in the, you know, they say you could take the Yid out of Mitzrayim, but it's hard to take the Mitzrayim out of the Yid, the Golas out of the Yid. I, you know, I met, uh, I know an elder Russian Yid who was on those trains when he was 15 years old. And he saw there was an article in the in, in one of these magazines, like the Mishpacha magazine, where someone had told over a little bit of the episode with Russia, how they got out, how they bla- they they schwarz the granite, how they went over the border. He heard this, he's asked scared. He told me, why are they talking about this publicly? He was still scared that, you know, maybe the Russians they're gonna figure out what's going on, you know. That night, the Russians were all closing the doors because in Russia, that's what they lived with, that fear. It was very difficult to go away from it, you know. Uh, they lived their whole life with this. Uh... So anyways, that was that was a very big... Uh, there was a, a book recently came out called Samarkand. I think the author came into the library to speak. Rabbi Hill, uh, Hillel Zaltzman. Yeah, I think we heard him. He, he wrote a book, it became a very famous book, translated into, it was in Hebrew, English, and Russian, where he describes the life of those families who remained, who were stuck in Russia after the bulk of the Hasidim left. And there was, how did they go to yesh- how did they keep yeshivas and chadarim, how did they keep kashras? It's a very fascinating, fascinating book. A few hundred pages, you saw it, yeah? Yeah. I'm, I'm coming out of that. Yeah, Givaldika book, and you could see Nikarim Dire Emes, and he really gives you every step of the way about all the families and how they did. You know, he, his family hosted one of the big, the greatest chassidim was Rabbi Kechain, a chassid who was from the most wanted in Russia for his activities. He lived in his house in a room. He never left the room. No one knew, except to go to the mikveh. No one knew that he lived in their house. None of the neighbors knew. He was blocked away, in, uh, locked away in a room, and didn't leave the room. And he lived that way for many, many years. For 10 years, he lived in hiding. And his wife lived by herself. She didn't want to even know where he was because this and that. 10 years later, he managed to... Uh, then he got to Israel. Yeah, he got to Israel. then he went out. He has a son in, in, in Kranites. He had children got married without him and everything. And he was sitting hiding in, a, in someone's house over there. The amazing thing was that people stayed, these people stayed normal even. To stay normal under such conditions, though. and number not only stay normal, to stay from a yidin and alay from a chassidish yidin, it was something unbelievable to determine. We shouldn't have to have these type of tzaddis. And uh, our nesayin is and nesayin that we have it. We could do everything. We could do it all. The shaila is and nesayin of ashiras. You know, we have it all. We could do it all. and We have to just do it. Amol, you find the Rebbe's last mimer that the Rebbe spoke. I, Lubavitcher Rebbe, the last mimer that he, he, he before he before he had the stroke in 1992, was a famous mimer where he describes the difference between the life the way it was in Russia, the life in America, and he says that in Russia you didn't have mesidus nefesh, but a lot of these same Jewish people that gave their lives, self sacrifice in Russia, they came later on to countries, artis harvacha, they came to countries of freedom. They didn't see that burning fire by them anymore. They went back to normal life. But when they're in Russia, they fought. And they don't see that adrenaline anymore, that chayis. So the real ultimate test is, if in, even in America, where you don't have anyone challenging you, to still live your life with that type of bread and chayis that you have when you have a managid, where you have an enemy trying to stop you from Yiddishkeit, and you stand up strong. So even when you're in America, we can't. Too much American chocolate could take us down and, 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 and numb us from the Mesidas Nefesh. So that's a little bit the lesson that we should take from you based Thomas. I want to take a look.
there's a, an, an interesting, every year the Rebbe used to fabrain when his father-in-law's day of his Geula and his Yimaledis, your basic Yimaletamus, and every year the Rebbe would have a new twist on something that could be learned out, a Hira and Avedis Hashem from what happened to his father-in-law. Different points, he discussed the arrest, discussed the Geula, discussed his Maimer, discussed a letter that he wrote then. Every year was a different Nekoda. So this is our Sikha where the Rebbe discusses an interesting thing. It doesn't actually have to do with his, 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 his arrest or his imprisonment, his release, but a letter that he wrote after he left encouraging Hasidim to utilize the year, one year later, 1928, encouraging them to use out this time of Yubeza Gimel Tamos as a day of strengthening themselves in Torah and in Yiddishkeit. And the Rebbe had some interesting diyukim into his father's words, into Fidekeva's words. And let's take a look at the Sikha. Oydis Yoyim Beis Tamos, a Yoyim Sheboy Nigal Kvayt Dush Mari Vachami, a Sore Shanes, a Begavoyd Agdelo Shavar Batatel Chidazakayad. Thus. About this day, Beis Tamos, the day that my father was was freed, were for spreading Yiddishkeit. Cause of Chagmecha, my father in law wrote in Mechtavay in his letter, Lachagikas, the Beis Tamos, the Rishon, the Mishnah, the Tapriches. This is what he wrote. A quote from one from his letter that he wrote on the occasion, the first celebration of the Geula. Mizela Shoyne, Roihu, it's befitting the Kove Yoyim Mitzvahs to make this a day of Abrengen, this Oyros to Ma'ora oneself, Lachiza Katayra, to strengthen one learning Torah, the Hayados and Yiddishkeit, the Chol Asar Vasar everywhere in the world, the Fi in Yane, every place according to its needs what it needs. Says the Rebbe, his bar come upon us. I call David Rebbe saying the same diok in him. All the words of our Rebbe's are very exact. A few of the Negeil is sichas. Even their sichas, even if it's not a mimer, the sicha. A few of the Negeil sichas chulun shalano. Because the Gemara says sichas chulun shalamidu chalam and tzvichin limud. Even mundane talk of a tamut chacham needs to be studied. A true tamut chacham. Kol shakal makav chaymer when you're talking about Dibbe Terasa, something about their Torah of theirs, which is not a sichas chulin. But the yes to say is koyil lo hayre say in Torah malashin ra. And for sure, when they actually tell you something, what to do, give you instructions, clear directives, they also have to be studied. When we unite in our case, you should die b'lashin chak meichad ma'anel chizuk katoyd avayados. The lashin of the Rebbe, my father-in-law, in in his letter was. That we have to be chazak Torah and Giddushkeit. The Rebbe here is going to Medayik. There's two kinds of Torah and Giddushkeit. Seems to be like redundant. Torah, Yiddishkeit, Yiddishkeit. Torah, what's the difference? The Rebbe is going to explain. L'chora Yadus and Hashem Kloli. The term Yadus, Yiddishkeit, is a general terminology. Hakoyel Kol Hashayich L'Das Yisrael. Includes everything that's connected to Yiddishkeit. Hang Limina Torah. Shemitah's kima mitzvahs, Torah learning, doing mitzvahs, whether the mitzvahs de raisa, de rabbanon, even in Hagi Yisrael, it's all part of the encompassing term Yadus Yiddishkeit. It encompasses everything. Vim Kain, if so, this is a very encompassing term. So the Rebbe should have just said, Just say, the day to be Mechazak Yadus. Why did he go and say, Chizak Torah and Yadus? What's the difference between Torah and Yadus? Yadus is all inclusive. So the Pash, as you could say, his Kavana was to stress Torah Dafke. General Chizok of Yiddishkeit and specifically Torah. Because that's one of the main reasons why he was put into jail. Pash, that Kavana was a Lahat Gisha Ingin, Vapulis, Chizok at Torah, Mishakos, a camp of the Vainal, Advar Devot, Havidose, Vabots at Torah. Hakavana kipshuta yisoid chadorim. He made chadorim in Russia. Yeshivish yuri toyer barama or baliyesuk. Even people that are working. But if so, if the Friedrich ever meant to bring out, stress the concept of Torah, okay. But first mention Yiddishkeit, then Torah. Yados is an all-encompassing term. It's the klal. You first mention chizaka yados the klal, and then you mention the prat of Torah. Yados. 
the Achakach lo hoitz vat gosha prata. You should do klal and then the prat. Yeah. Okay, but he's using it. If that's okay, even if it came up. Right. We, we're not here getting here into the language, what, even if he wrote in English. The question is, he's saying two points, or Torah and Yiddishkeit. So if he meant to say, I want to stress, Dafki Yiddish Torah, have a chizuk for Chalal and Yiddishkeit, specifically Torah, say first Yiddishkeit and Torah. Well, Torah Yiddishkeit. Today was Yud Beis, and tonight and, and tomorrow is Yud Gimel. Right, that's right. The Rebbe is always very medayik. The Rebbe is very medayik and learns a lot of the yukim in his in the Rebbe's in his Friedrich Rebbe's words. You'll see in a minute the Rebbe has a nice idea, a gedayik that he wants to give over. Also, what's the word chizukatayra? In that very letter itself, the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, used most of the times the word. Harbotzas HaToyro. But here we use the word Chizok HaToyro. So says the Rebbe like this. Nero Loimer, it seems to say, Sha'achas HaKavon is one of the reasons. The Chak Mechamer Kanhi, why he wrote it this way was, Loi lo Oira Shnei Yamsham. He did not mean that we have to have us Oiras for two things. Toira Yiddishkeit. It's Chaskus Ba'avedis Harbotzas HaToyro Ba'avedis HaToyro Ba'avedis HaToyro Ba'avedis HaToyro The Rebbe meant one thing here. You should be mechazek Yiddishkeit in this day. That's all. Why did he mention Torah first? How do we know what Yiddishkeit is? How do we define Yiddishkeit? We have to look into Torah. It's the appropriate way to mechazek Yiddishkeit is only We first need to know what Torah says to define Yiddishkeit. You know. Many different people stand up and have their own ideas about what Yiddishkeit means. Wide ranges of views, what does it mean Yiddishkeit? So before we learn about Yiddishkeit, we need to know, we have to look into Torah, how Torah defines Yiddishkeit. So the, that's why the Fidei Gemara wrote, Chizok HaToyrah Vayadus. Yadus is defined by Torah. What's the explanation? Siv based. The concept of Yadus, the simple meaning of the word Yadus means the general behavior of Jews as Jews. It means Yiddishkeit. A yoist that Yiddishkeit has a, can be interpreted as a human transmission and, and, and uh, behavior, how Jewish people behave, Mesha generations, that's how what Yiddishkeit means. So the Rebbe, that's not true. Yiddishkeit does not interpret how people act. Yiddishkeit is defined by Torah. That's how we're going to redefine Yiddishkeit. It's not like you're learning in a project in a, in a college. It's not a culture. It's not a culture. It's not a culture. Yiddish guy is not a culture. It's not if you eat knishes, you eat gefilte fish, or you like Yiddish songs. That's that's Yiddish guy. Yados is defined by Torah. Defines the Yados. Zehu Torah and Rosh Chizok Torah by Yados. She lefnei Chizok Yados. Before one strengthens Yiddish guy. You first, you start with Chazak Sa'amuna, Vakari to strengthen the Muna and the recognition. Rak Hatorida he Akavas Mayadis. Only Torah can decide and define what is Yiddish Kamun. Meaning, Ve'ina Dover Mosul Bnei Adam, human beings, people cannot make it up. Shebesicham with their mind, Yachri, page 146. Shinyanim with Siyamim Elu Bayadis in Koiva. They will decide certain things are obligatory. Shaken Yonam Achayim, other things are not. Halakol Prat Ebrach, that every detail of the Torah add the Chiddush of Talmud Vasik, even to the Chiddush of a Talmud. The Gemara says, everything Akoil Nitalamoy Shemisinai. 
all of Torah was given to Moshe at Sinai. Even what a, a future generations, all the way down in history, a Talmud Vasik, a appropriate Talmud, who knows how to learn Torah according to the rules of Torah, and he learns Torah and finds Chidushim in there. When he uses the method the Torah gives, his Chidushim were given by Moshe at Sinai. And he's just revealing what was concealed. He's bringing out the light that was there already. Someone who makes a true Chiddush, that's such a Chiddush that it's not, doesn't have a basis in Torah really, it's not, it wasn't given by Sinai, it's not a real Chiddush. Real Chiddush we don't want. The Chiddush that we like is when someone shows that that's what the text really meant all along. That's what's lying in the words. If you learn like that, such a type of Limud, then that Torah was already given by Sinai. So all the Minhagim, if these menhagim were accepted by the majority of Klal Yisrael, it's considered all part of Torah, even menhagim. Like the Toysus says, Kafilu minik Yisrael Torah. Toysus and the Shochanara brings down even a minik Yisrael. It's considered part of Torah. It's not just a cultural thing. And by the by the Havdol, by Goyim, say there's a custom, it's a culture. You can do without it. In Klal Yisrael, a minig is very important. It's not just important because that's what the Baba did. Because the Baba liked to make a filter fish. If it's a real minig, it's important because Torah gives it importance. Torah gives it importance. It has a real meaning to it. The way it was handed down was different. Every single thing had its time in Torah when it was revealed. For example, you know, before Rashi and Rabbeinu, Rashi being a time of the Machloik is how the parashi should be worn. Yeah, I know. All along in history, they didn't know what to do. Oh, so there were different times in history. At certain times in history, you didn't eat chicken with milk, right? Have you see a glili had chicken with milk? And before that, before the period there was a takana, all of Kla you saw chicken with milk. There were gazeiras. There were gazeiras at different times in history. These gazeiras are what are part of Torah. Torah itself is a mitzvah in the Torah to listen to Chachamim. Chachamim see the need for it. Or Chachamim learn out things from the Torah. We learn out from Psukim based on the Yugimum Midisha Torah and Adreshes Behem. When a Talmud Chacham comes today and he learns in Shulchan Aruch Pshat and he's a Poisik and he learns Pshat and Shulchan Aruch and he has, he's a Yiddish Shemayim and he learns according to the Klolei HaTorah his Chiddush that he's Mechadish becomes a part of Torah has Kedusha to it and you can't put it on the floor I, why not? It's his own Seichel it's his Seichel, no it's not his Seichel his Seichel was Zoycha, he was Zoycha to reveal it and to uncover that Chiddush but that Chiddush now he just revealed the Chiddush the Chiddush is a part and parcel of the Torah of all generations and that's what it, how we look at the Raisa, the Rabbanim, Mahogim, it's all the word of Hashem. Alamai, it came through uh, this Chacham, it came through this Chacham, it came, it was revealed at this time in history. A Navi taught us something, it, it took, every time, every Indian has its time in history when it's supposed to be revealed. But that generation needs it. The previous generation didn't need that Indian. When it came the time for that Indian to be Nizgala, was Nizgala. Any Indian in Torah, any real Indian in Torah is that way. Any Minig is that way. According to you, all Jews everywhere have to observe Yudhim of Hamut. According to the Kehillah, that's true. If they know about it, they should. <laughs> Every Minhagim has different Kehillahs. Minhagim go according to Kehillahs. So Minhagim have different, that's okay. Every kehila has its minik, and asra the rav kirav. Every place has its rav, the paskins, the shilas. 
And that's 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 the word of Hashem. That's what Hashem, Hashem wants in one city. The Rav says that I think this is the halacha. Another city, a Rav Seichel says that the halacha is differently. Which one is correct? They're both correct. Eilu ve'eilu, divri lekim chayim. Beisham and Beisil are both correct. Either the opposite. Hashem's Ratzon is, the Ratzon of Hashem, the way the Torah is set up, He gave it over to the Chachamim, and every Chacham who is a Yir Shemayim, and he's learning Torah for the proper reasons, not for politics, and not for any ulterior motives. He learns Torah L'shma, and he knows how to learn. And he paskins a Shaila, that Shaila is Torah. That's Torah, and, and a person who lives in that city is Mechuyiv to follow the Bezdin or the Poisik of that city. And now, and, and now, after the goal, and, and now that we're all together, and uh, yeah, it's, it's different. You have all the Bati Dinim and Abanim in one in, in, in one community, but it used to be in Europe. You had a, a Minigamakim, you had a place, and that's that's what the Torah, that's what Hashem said. When you have a Sanhedrin, Achirabim Lahatis, you go according to the majority. Mashiach will come, will have a Sanhedrin, everyone will conform to one one Shita. Is Lamaisa. From here it's understood. Someone who is more lenient with Chumris or Menhagi Yisrael, that were enacted later on in history, and he thinks, ah, people made it, I don't really need to keep it. It's If someone says, I don't want to keep this thing, it's not, he says, I don't, I don't, I hold, not that I'm not up to keeping it. Someone says, I'm not up to keeping it. He says, I know this is truly what I should be doing. I'm not up to it. I'm not on a high level. I want to be there. But someone who, that's, diff- that's one story, but someone who says, I hold, it's man-made, I don't have to keep it. Someone who says that, he's not only missing that detail of Yiddishkeit, it means his whole approach to Yiddishkeit is something wrong. Yeah, the filter fish is just a joke. No, no, it, no, I'm telling you that it's really something serious. No, no. No, it is, I'll explain to you, let me explain to you why. Yeah. The whole thing about the filter fish. The buyer. Okay. Now, according to this, to your way of thinking, so since it became a minhag based upon based upon a lot of the reasoning, so to eat the filter fish every time, so according to you, all Ashkenazi Jews are obligated to eat the filter fish. No. First of all, it does not mention in Shulchan Aruch anywhere that they have to, the, the meaning of eating a filter fish. No, okay, but it, 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 there's a lot of things you guys do that, that are not mentioned in the Shulchan Aruch. Yeah, you have to understand, when it comes to obligating someone to do something, there's different levels. When someone has an obligation of uh, something, when when majority of Klal Yisrael takes something upon themselves, then it's not in, 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 in Klal Yisrael. Then it is? Becomes mechuy even klal yisrael. Okay, so if that's the case, Yemenite Jews. If you don't belong to another kahila, oh, so this, you don't belong yeah, to them. It's a lot of gray area, but there's a lot of discussions about yeah, menhagim. Okay. Your filter vision is not from the big menhagim. Even cholent, let's say cholent is a minig. He cholent, right? What happens if someone makes it despite everyone spices it differently, and makes it differently? It's a shini the minig. The minig is to have something hot. The shulchan aruch says. If someone doesn't yeah, have five, five can have right? If someone doesn't have challenge, we check after him. Uh, but what happens if someone for dietary reasons or right? But it says what happens if hot hot hurts you? The Shulchan Aruch clearly says yeah. it's something else. The question is why are you not doing it? Why are you not doing it? Ultimately, if someone comes with a mahalik where he questions the minig, he questions the chachamim, and then he goes back to question the Torah because. Where are you stopping? Where are you drawing your lines? You, you, you decide here, and someone else decides here, and then someone else decides there. The way the Torah was given was that Meshach the generations, new things were revealed. New in the element Torah. When it came out, a new Sefer. When it comes out, a Gavaldika Sefer like Rabchaim Brisker. 
there was a certain time in history, Ashkacha Pratis, that was designed that this Tkufa, these Chedushim are going to be revealed. That's a Tkufa when it was supposed to be. It didn't just Stamazai happen. But this is part of Hashkocha. But they have Falcon that say it's no good. It's, 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 it's good, Eilu ve'Eilu. As long as the two Chachamim are Chachamim, and they're both Yirei Shemaim, and they both the learn Kol Ha'at the Rambam and the Ravid. Or the Shulchan people, the Marshal, I don't know, they said against Shulchan Every generation had. Beisham and Beisilol. Beisham and Beisilol, but uh, once it's accepted, accepted once that Chacham is accepted by Kla Yisrael, that's it. It's hard, I'll give you an example. Pesach, right? Some people eat rice and pesach, it's almost normal. For some people, it's 100%. There. For that, Mons with our minigas that way, that's their minigas. And this is the real Kimchai, this is the real Right. No, I, I don't know. Kidney is the Ashkenaz, and we do kidney. It's a bit of slurry. The Arach HaShokhan of the tremendous Michael, he says, if you, if you say against kidney, it's very shaky, it's you don't have even a, a feeling for Yiddishai, like really rest. <laughs> No, I'm saying, and he was a big guy. I mean, yeah. you know, in Eretz now, every year, Pesach, in the in the Kari Shon, in the Zrachi paper, there's ten pages. So you have to be Yeah. yeah. But why are you? But Our once the, you always have that in, in Torah with the arguments. But once the minig became accepted, and that's the way that was accepted, that becomes part of it. That's the rule that the rules of Torah. Those are the rules. The Rambam himself writes this. The Rambam himself writes that any xeris or things that were accepted upon Klaus took upon themselves, that becomes accepted. A person ha- doesn't have the right to come and say, "I think differently." That's a zakin mamre. If if you're zak- if you're zakin. <laughs> to be a Zakim Amre is a big, you have to be a big Tamil Chacham. But, uh. It's just a Mamre, it's not so it's not the same. Veloyoid, that's like the bottom of page 146, the right column. Veloyoid, not only this, that this sheet of this Mahalich, Lachalik bin Yoni Tereish of Alpeh, I mean, you saw them Tereish of to make differentiations between different parts of Tereish of Alpeh. That this is from Hashem, and this is humanistic. Between these things, this is a lotion of the Rambam in Ilchas Mamrim. To those gezeris, takonas and hagim, someone is going to deny in these gezeris and takonas and hagim. It's an opening the door to eventual kfira beikish teirish beikulam and hashem. You start off with that, you'll keep on going and saying that bechlal the whole teirish of a chas I don't, I don't, we don't know. I don't know if it's min hashem. By the way, based on this, we're going to go further in a minute. What's the difference? The way, the way chsidis. The way when you look in, in, a, in a, a Kabbalah outlook, how do you look at the differentiations between something when it's the Raisa, the Rabbanan, or it's a We know that we're more makel with the Rabbanan, Safik the Rabbanan, Lakula, Safik the Raisa, Lachumra, and a minig even more makel, right? Why? Shouldn't that be because, isn't that because the Rabbanan is not so much the word of Hashem, and a minig is even less than the word of Hashem? Does that ever know? They are all the word of Hashem. This is all Torah. Why are we lenient by the Rabbanon? It's because the Torah says that you should be lenient by the Rabbanon. The Torah gave that cloud. It's not that we, we're giving our own cloud. We're saying, we're not sure really if the Rabbanon is something we should be doing. So, Safik, the Chas V'Shalom, Safik, the Rabbanon, the Kula. And that's not the Pshat. We know 100%. The Torah says you should not steer away, not to the right and not to the left of anything Chacham tell you. We know you have to listen to Chacham. I, why are we lenient with Dibri Chachamim? Because the Chacham Torah itself tells you that with these and Yonim, Safek, the Rabbanon, the Kula. When we come to me, 
The same the thing. More, the same thing. The mini. Minigu- we don't say Rabbanon. No, mini is still a tailor. It's even stronger than Rabbanon. Not like Gabi, no, like Gabi, this thing, they're all part of Torah. Right, but... Minigis all Torah right? applies to everything. The, the Kiddush is an even a minig is. It's Torah, you don't say... Even a minig is Torah. it's so strong. Most yeah. But, but even in the Torah itself, if a, if a thing is not so hammer, so then, uh, you know, obviously... The, the all because the Torah... Torah it, it, it's something is a Ratzon Hashem, right? It's the Ratzon Hashem. The Rats and Hashem to keep six and thirteen mitzvahs. Why are the differences between this is what he wanted? Right. The he, he said this this one, he said you're gonna get this Aveda, this right. one's ad hoc. But the Abish to define the differences. Right. Right. If otherwise we wouldn't have any way to make any chilukim. Right. We wouldn't have any way to decide what's more hard, what's less hard. All the definitions we have are not our definitions. It's the Torah's definitions. The Zavar to Rukhain Brisker said when he learns Torah, he's not looking to understand why. Why it's so. Why the halach is this way. He's he doesn't he's not trying to learn farvas, he's trying to learn vas state. What is the halach? I'm trying to define and learn what the halach is. Why the halach was given that way? That's the halach the way it was given. That I'm doing it because Hashem gave it. He could also give reasons, but he's saying what his point in his learning was, I want to know Vashtate. Vashtate, and that's what they have to do. Farvas is another story. We have no definitions of bad or good. We see the world today, society. Um, 50, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, Goyim decided that we're more moral. So now today they decide that morality is different. As time goes along, morality keeps on changing. The world, every country, defines morality they want. They want to define morality. In Saudi Arabia, it's one way. In Iraq, one way. In Iran, one way. In the state of Israel, another way. And, and in America, it's another way. In France, everyone defines. And in and, and Germany, during the war, define morality in their way. So after they, after someone were, after they killed and they were in the camps, at night they went to the bar and they listened to music. And they pet their, their dogs. So every country defines morality. And we want to define what's important and what's not important. Right. Only way is Torah. Torah definitions. If we come with our own outlook, you get all mixed up. Let's take a look at Siv Gimel. You know, this really comes down to the point. Everything is Hashem. Ene Movade. Everything really comes from Hashem. The, all the differentiations, Hashem created these def- differentiations. He created it this way. He made it this way. This is the way it is in creation, but for sure in Torah itself, all the differentiations themselves, Hashem, this, all, all things that we should be doing, if someone does a mitzvah rabban and he's connecting himself to Hashem, he's connecting himself to Hashem, Hashem himself, just this, the way this mitzvah was designed, it came about through a gilu at a certain time period when it was necessary and by a certain chacham. Now that the Rebbe explained what his father meant by saying first Torah and then Yadus, because Yadus has to be defined by Torah. I'll share with you a short story, which I think I might have shared with you in the past. And I should say, Oilam is here. Like he talks about America's sleepers. Oh, I love story. that story. Yeah, it's an important story. And I was going to ask you, so I'm not feeling more. That's about you start telling me that story. I said, wait a minute, I know who it is. <laughs> Someone told you the story? Yeah. Like, I, I got it from my niece. He told you the story that happened to me? Yeah. But I don't, you saw that I don't know how we heard it. Or I don't know what, so I, I never told all the story. I, I'm telling you. Tell that's awesome. an audio. Yeah. My, story gets I around. Him, so I, 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 I maybe he had it a little different. I said, listen, I heard the man. This is they say that some stories, you know, they say some stories happen to all that shunim. Because every Dashan says that the story happened to him. <laughs> but this is not, this story really happened to me. This story really happened to me. I was a... Uh, I was in California, we were in Bachram Yeshiva in California, and the summer, 
instead of going home, we went for three weeks, we went around to the Chazik Yiddishkeit in a city in California that had no from shul, no from presence. We were staying in a nearby place, in a Chabad Shliach's home. We lived in an area we had over there, the minion, whatever we needed. But we would every day take a car and travel to an area. And to, we wanted to, to, to meet Yidin, sell them mezuzahs, put up mezuzahs, give, uh, put on film with them, sell them a period of film. We had in our trunk uh, a mini library full of all the swarm we could, we could put in there and try to meet people. It was a very interesting experience. We even had a, we went to, uh, during the day, we used to go, how did we find out who's Yidin? So during the day, we would go from store to store, classic Lubavitch style, and we'd say, are there any Jews here? And we met Jewish people that way. Some were interested, some were not interested. Sometimes they were not interested. The guy told us, yeah, he's Jewish. <laughs> he was cringing in the corner. <laughs> and all different types you meet, you know? We met to one pe a pet doctor, Alan Schwartz, I think his name was. And this guy was so interested. His secretary told us to wait. He's with a pet, I don't know, but waited for a few minutes. He came out. He said that he is in the conser the Reform Temple. He loves learning. He was a very sincere guy, and he, he doesn't know much about the Reform. Conser he knows that we're Orthodox. He wants, he, he leads a Parsha class. They sit together and they study the weekly Parsha in the Reform Temple before they dive in. So he's really interested to hear how we learn Torah. He wants to hear. He's, he's a serious guy, this guy. He likes to learn. So he invited us. He said, please, I want to make a get-together. I'm going to invite the whole class. They're all going to come to my house one evening. We'll have a little fire over there and a bonfire. We'll, we'll have an evening and you'll talk about yourselves. You know, Yeshiva Bachum from Cal, originally from New York and you're coming to visit. Well, my sir, we scheduled this for the ending of our stay and... It was an unbelievable event. They all came there armed with all the newspaper articles against Orthodox people and whatever you want. They had it underneath their chairs. They pulled it out. What about what it says in this paper here about you guys and this and that? And you know, you had to answer up with the question. But all of it was a beautiful event. We set up a table with Svarim and uh, different CDs and, and things. And people came there, were buying things. It was a very beautiful event. Glad that this guy's wife was never a, a shiksa. But she was a real uh, tzaddikis, we should say. <laughs> she really, she, she was very happy, excited about the whole. Uh... The was we eventually we met over there. We met, we privately met the reform rabbi and the conservative rabbi because one of the ways that we got into people was we told them we know their rabbi was already like an inn. So we met with the reform rabbi and the conservative rabbi. We didn't go to their temple, but we met them in their office. And we said, we're in town, we're here. So uh, the reform rabbi was interesting. The reform rabbi, he was not too happy that we, we got this congregate. He said, yeah, he's a little bit of a literalist. He tried to downplay it that we got him to make this uh, shear. And Nebuchadnezzar, his daughter, married a Meir Sha'aramnik. She became totally from Meir Sha'aramnik. And and he told me, it, my kids, they say I'm a koifer and happy koifer. Like the rabbi, the reform rabbi. Reform rabbi's daughter became a balash tshuva. Uh -huh. She married a guy from Meir Sha'arim. When they come to visit, they stay by him and they walk 45 minutes to the to the Chabad shul to Davin. And he says, I want to show solidarity for my kids. And that's very embarrassing from the situation. He drives over to the Chabad shul Shabbos to participate in the davening with his kids. Solidarity. And his Lamaisa was, we met the conservative rabbi there. And the conservative rabbi learned in yeshiva when he was younger. He learned in yeshiva when he was in high school, but when he was old, he went to college. Eventually, he didn't want from anymore. I don't know exactly what his home was like. And later on, he went inside. He wants to be a rabbi. He went to the conservative college, a metro New Haven, wherever it is over there. And he became a conservative rabbi. So this rabbi, we met another Jew on one of our trips during the day, we're knocking on, uh, going to different stores, we met a guy, his name was Mark. And Mark told us that, you know, I'm not too religious, and I don't really, you know, it's not for me. For me, I feel the main thing is just to be a good, nice person. That's what religion is about. He said, Rabbi Pascal, the conservative rabbi, this older conservative rabbi that we met, 
he invited, he invites me, asked me to help make a minion. Mondays and Thursdays, they struggle with a minion in the conservative temple. Could, could I come in? So to be a gentleman, to be nice, I come. It's not really my thing, but you know, it's to be a mensch. I come and join the temple, the, the, the prayers over there. Anyways, the Maisa, he tells me, we had a very good conversation with this guy, Mark, but we started talking about Yiddishkeit and everything. Then he started getting, he told us a story. He said that we got very upset with us. He said that you guys are cruel and this, and we didn't understand. What is he talking? What cruelty? I'll tell you a story. It was one time here, it was a Monday morning. A Holocaust survivor, a 90 year Holocaust survivor, came to say Kaddish for his parents in the Holocaust. And there was only nine people in the meeting. And he, the rabbi asked me, Mark, could you please go out into the, the building, go around the temple and see maybe you can find someone else to join. So I went out and I went into the big sanctuary which we use on Shabbat. And I see an Orthodox Torah cleaner cleaning the Torah scrolls. These are the words he used. However you understand it. A cipher. cipher. There was an Orthodox Torah cleaner. So I invited him to come to the minion. He said, no problem, for sure I'll come to the minion. He came into the to the room. He sees that we have women participating in the minion. The women were also wearing tefillin, but the women were participating in the minion. So Lomaisa, he said, I can't join the minion. It's not a minion. So he said to him, please, just come in just for a Kaddish, you know, this. I can't, I'm Orthodox, I can't. So he said, but you know, we have our Holocaust survivor. He's 90 years old. He came just today, just for yard site. Say Kaddish, please join. Can't join. Nothing could, can't join, he's not joining the minion. He told me, turns to us, he says, this is cruelty. What is religion? Make you a good person, to make you a mensch. I'm not religious, he says. I just do this to be nice. And this is what you guys do to this Holocaust survivor? I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to explain to him? How am I, what words can I use to the Abish to help? I said to him, Mark, you didn't let the man say Kaddish? He says, no, we didn't have a minion. I said, Mark, how cruel could you be? How cruel could you be? Like, what do you mean? We couldn't let the man say Kaddish. Who cares if there wasn't 10 people? I said, let the man say Kaddish. Just make him feel good. Oh, Rabbi, you're right. I said, I don't understand. If you want to make people feel good, make them feel good. If you want to keep what the Torah says, keep what the Torah The same rabbis that said it's 10, said it's 10 men. If you want to go with it, you go with it. You don't want to go with it. So when we talk about if a person starts to say certain this prat and this prat, it only leads more and more. We know the early reform started that way. They didn't start off. There was no jump. There was no jump. They didn't just suddenly one day pick up and say, we're leaving Yiddishkeit. It was slowly where they say, how about let's do this, let's do that, and we're moving to the edge. And starts off with legitimate heterim. Legitimate heterim. But if these heterim were not, were not, G'doyli Yisrael did not back them because they saw where the Ruach was. Where the Ruach and spirit of these heterim was going, the wrong heterim. We know recently we had a group, they called themselves Open Orthodoxy. That broke off from modern orthodoxy, and Gedoyli Yisrael stood up uh, a year ago and said, "We will go and said, that's it. This group is is, 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 is we're not accepting the kedushin, we're not accepting the gitim, we're not accepting the gerus. They made a cutoff. Sometimes things look like it's legitimate. It has attained the original reform. So why can't the guy, just like in the in the in the church, they play the organ? Why can we have the on the shul?" We can have a guy in Shabbos play the organ. What's the problem? It, playing an organ is only a derabonim. Having a guy play it is, a, is another derabonim. That's called a shvost to shvost. And he's playing for making enhancing the beautifulness of the tefillah is a mitzvah. Tzairich mitzvah. Shvost to shvost with tzairich mitzvah's mutter. It's a legitimate hatter. Sounds like a legitimate hatter. The problem that, has, that we Chachamim had with it it wasn't that it wasn't legitimate. That wasn't the issue with the legitimacy. The issue was the whole thing wasn't legit. The whole kav, the whole mahalach where they're going. They want to be like the... Hayoyim, the Yitzhahara says in Gemara, Hayoyim, Oymele Today he tells you to do this. 
And, and then Machorim Elei Asei Kach, and tomorrow until he says, Lei Chayivet Avayda Zara. You think when they worshipped Avayda Zara, it was overnight, he suddenly one day stood up and said, I like Avayda Zara. It starts off slowly, you know, you, you move in that direction. It could be a, a lot of years of progress, but eventually someone could come, it could be Nasa Saduki. So, a person has to always keep strong and mechazek each other, and especially when it comes to Kiruv, the rest of the Sikha, we have to go to Mairev now, the rest of the Sikha, the Rebbe is clarifying that the Friedrich Rebbe wanted to stress this in this letter, that Yiddishkeit is based on Torah, because he says how we have to spread Yiddishkeit every single place in the world according to the Minigamakim. When you spread Yiddishkeit around the world, it's very difficult not to make Kulas and a Teirah. Wherever you are, wherever you could be, it could be even a Chabad Shriach, it could be wherever it would be, Wherever someone is doing Kiruv, it's a big Nisayan to keep strong in Yiddishkeit and not to make any changes because people are demanding different changes. This, this Balabas says, I don't like the Mechitza. And I want the Mechitza to be smaller or not to be so big. Someone else says, I want my daughter to have a Bas Mitzvah by the Torah in order to give out this Drash and that Drash. And it's a lot of Nisayanists. And especially when you're spreading Yiddishkeit, you have to know to be very, very strong and not to make changes. You move on, obviously, someone is coming close to the Yiddish guy, you start one mitzvah at a time. One mitzvah at a time, not, we're not lying to the person. We're not changing Torah. We're telling you there are 613 mitzvahs and you have to keep them all. At this point, you're not ready for all of them, you keep one. It's like a child. A child, you don't write when a child gets to the age of Chinuch, you don't just throw them in and everything. The child slowly develops into Torah and mitzvahs. He starts to do one mitzvah, another mitzvah, as his koyach, and he grows older. So too you have a child in years, of someone who never knew about Yiddishkeit, and suddenly you come and tell it to him, and you tell him, you gotta do this whole Kitzah Shechon Aruch overnight, he's walking out the door. And if he accepted your offer to do it overnight, I would check him out, my psychologist. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> and it's a process, and it takes a mitzvah at a time, and some go quicker, some go slower, but... We're not telling someone, you can't tell someone, the reform rabbi when we met him in this town said, it's so sad that my daughter, my son won't daven by me. And why won't you guys come into my temple? So he, and he says, to me, I, I said, you know, we were, we were different. We're different denomination. He tells me, you can keep some 613 mitzvahs in my temple. I don't mind. You want to keep the whole Torah? You can be a from you in my temple. What's the chilek, he tells me? Some of my congregants, I, I see that they like dietary, they're into food, I tell them keep kosher. Other ones, they like this, I tell them keep this mitzvah. He gives suggestions out. He told me we, we're very careful in this temple to stay away from the word God commanded. God suggested, commanded, but he tells me that I have people here keep one mitzvah, two mitzvah, three mitzvah. You want, you can keep 613. He doesn't have anyone keeping 613, but what's the seed? I said there's a big difference. You hold it's arbitrary. You hold, yeah, someone can come to Yeshua and keep 613, but you don't have to keep the 613. So it doesn't, if someone does all the mitzvahs in the Torah, he keeps all 613 mitzvahs. He's very from, he's a chassid, he's the most chassidish yid around, but he believes he doesn't have to, he's a koifer. If a guy does everything he's supposed to do, but he believes he doesn't have to, he's just doing it because he likes to do it, He's a koi for the Yud Gim Likrim. Now this is a says, and, and by the way, someone who's totally not from, but he believes you have to keep the whole Torah. Just to have a bow, I have a Tivus, and I can't control myself, and I'm not gonna, I can't, I'm not want to do it. He's not a koi for. He's a Mumr Lateyavid. He's not a koi for. He believes in Torah, and he knows what Torah is about. And there's a bit hope that one day we'll get a little older and become a little smarter, your elder, your clicker, and I'll realize that the tivis are just flo- go away. It's only temporary, and the only thing that's everlasting is Hashem Malikeichem Emes. The only thing which is true, the Eibushter and Torah, and this is the only thing that are true, and a person takes with him the Oilama Emes. So that's what we have to know for you based Tamos. I'm not going to be here tomorrow.
the main point of the sicha we said, and that, that we just now has it over the 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 poichin of the second half. That's the, the lesson we learned from the Fidik Rebbe should all give us chizuk that no matter what times we are, and even we're in America, sometimes we're at the workplace, and we have a challenge with a yamake, or whatever it may be, the challenge would be where every person has their own challenges. When, when people are not looking, we have to always know to keep strong and have a little bit of mesidah nefesh. We don't, we're not asking anyone to go into fire and not go into water. There was a time period that the Rebbe by Fabrengen there were Hasidim who left Russia, it was the early 30, uh, 70s, I think. A family that came out, and they had children that learned in a cheder, in a, in a, in a, in a secret cheder in Russia. By the Fabrengen, and the Rebbe asked that the children should come up, it was before Pesach, and they should say the Manishtana. And they stood up saying the Manishtana in Yiddish. And the Rebbe was so emotional from the fact that the, these boys came out from Russia, and they were saying in Yiddish, right after they... they, they they finished saying the Manashtana, the Rebbe stood up and jumped up and the Rebbe started singing a Russian song in Yiddish with the toich, in Russian, which the, 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 the content is we will go on fire and we will go on water to keep Yiddishkeit alive. Baruch Hashem, we don't have to go on fire, we don't have to go on water. But even uh, we still have to have a, a bissel shtarkeit on, on hold strong and mechazek ourselves. Yiddishkeit, Emir Hashem will soon see the Biyaz Goyal Tzadik Amen. Amen.